Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. Over the past few years, a variety of handhelds have been released, and nothing under $200 can run GameCube well. Once we caught news that Odroid were releasing one with the power of the N2+, we had to order one right away. Package from FedEx. Well, actually, this came straight from Hard Kernel in Korea, and off the bat, we're quite unimpressed with the packaging. This little doofer here says do it yourself. Maybe we need to design our own box. Jessica came in a nice box. Unfortunately, she recently got a puncture which limits our time together. And here it is. Surprisingly, there's very little here. We have this very unique USB cable. And it's quite short. And then we have the handle itself. It's protected by this polystyrene type material. And while it does its job, it is very bare bones. I'll get a couple of curry wasps. And this is the Go Ultra. It has the usual D-pad, as well as four face buttons here, two analog sticks, and four buttons along the bottom. There's two buttons at the top here, and there's a five-inch display in the center. It's an 854-480 TFT LCD. Along the top we have the shoulder buttons, the power button, there's some foam here, I believe that's for the intake or exhaust. We have plus and minus for the volume, headphone jack, USB-C, and USB-A port. Both left and right sides are blank, and underneath we have the micro USB slot. On the back, an Odroid logo, and the gaps are here so heat can escape from the system. In the center we've got a root switch, and some fool decided to only have one speaker located on the back. Let's now get to the size comparison. The Go Ultra is this much bigger than the harmonica. As not many people have a harmonica, let's compare it to something more relatable. The screen itself is twice the size of a Roybush teabag, and the system itself is around three Roybush teabags big. Mine is large. Or perhaps you prefer to compare it to some other handhelds. Here's the Retro Pocket 3, and you can see that the Ultra has a slightly larger display, but these bezels are massive. Thank you for noticing. The Ultra actually looks a lot like the RG552. The Ultra has a smaller display, larger bezels, but the system itself is the same size. If anything, the Ultra looks and feels far cheaper than both of these products. And maybe this, and this, and this. Even though it feels quite light in the hands, it's just shy of 300 grams. It sits in between the heavy 552 and the much lighter Retro Pocket 3. Now let's get to the controls. So the D-pad itself actually feels very squishy. It's like there's no resistance here at all. The face buttons feel quite tactile, but also little resistance and very cheap. The analog sticks feel very similar to a Nintendo Switch, except for they don't move as far, and they don't click. These grey buttons down the bottom are used to start and select, they're squishy, and pretty much every button on the top is clicky. Thankfully, unlike the RG552, you can push the L1 and R1 shoulder buttons from the corners. The Ultra doesn't feel that bad in the hands, but the D-pad and face buttons will need modding if we want to play this for a long amount of time. Let's turn it on. Nothing. The batteries of the Ultra are actually discharged before they're sent out. To turn it on, we'll need to charge it to full using the included USB cable, and I used a 2 amp adapter. It takes this long to boot up. Imagine if you walked into a bar and there was a long line of people waiting to take a swing at you. That is the punchline. Why did the old man fall in the well? Because he couldn't see that. The well. I am John Luke. Alright, not bad. But we're greeted to a very empty system. It's as bare bones as you can get. And as there's no Wi-Fi module on the board, we need to use a Wi-Fi dongle. Which even when connected, didn't do much. So we got a micro SD, we use banana etcher to burn on the image from the wiki page, stick it in the ultra, hold the root button in, turn it on, and now with our handheld plugged into a Linux machine, we can copy the ROMs straight over. And we have success. To exit we push this black button in the top left, and if we open up the game again, it'll carry on where we left it. There's also one thing I noticed, that this menu didn't display many of the ROMs I covered over. Either way, here's some Tekken 6.
The screen of the Ultra is quite disappointing when put side to side with its competition. It's not as bright, and the reds are actually very orangey. Some of the systems refuse to load, but we're instructed to where the BIOS needs to be. So go into Linux, copy over the BIOS files, add a few more games, and then edit the ES systems file to add more file types. And now at last, we get to play. So the system itself is very similar to a RetroPie. At stock around 70 systems are supported, from the Atari 2600 all the way to a PSP or GameCube. We know the N2 Plus can handle a lot, so how far can we push this little thing? We'll first start with the arcade systems, and right off the bat we can see that it's uses by linear filtering. That's the soft blur around the pixels. Truxton should be a vertical game, but it's stretched outwards, making this look pretty bad. We're sad to see that Killer Instinct Arcade is unplayable. Let's move on now to the handhelds. First up is Lynx. The palette used for Game Boy is not great. It looks very dark and looks like graphite pencil. This game, however, is brilliant. It's Torican for the Game Boy. PSP for the most part is running pretty decent at two times resolution. If you need any help setting this up, please check our Retroid Pocket 3 guide. Outrun does stumble a bit at two times resolution. Changing frame skip to one makes it very playable. Wi-Fi Pulse also runs pretty slow at two times resolution on buffered setting. To speed this up, we can also use frame skip, which makes it fully playable. Unbuffered setting just bugs out. This is probably fixable by the guys at PPSP, and if they can fix that, this will run flawlessly. Here's Loco Rocco. Some Burnout Legends. Here's God of War. It runs pretty badly, two times resolution, with no frame skip. To make this somewhat playable, we need a frame skip of two or three, or use one times resolution. Now it's time for the consoles.
Sega Saturn emulation is almost at 100%. It's very close. If we could change options somehow, I'm sure we can get this at 100% speed. Even with the Saturn running a little slow, it's good to know that the Dreamcast runs really well on this little handheld. But this D-pad is poor when it comes to fighting games. One Hadouken may be fine, but trying to pull off a super is very frustrating. We also had success with Naomi. Put the Naomi BIOS file in the Flycast folder and one of its games in the GameCube folder and it ran really well. Main problem with the software right now is we can't get to the RetroArch menu to change our controls. Now let's move on to the big end. Something wrong here, check out Kirby's face. When it comes to GameCube, no. Just keep an eye on the frame rate at the very top left.
Mario Kart Double Dash is running around 30 frames per second. Again, if we had access to settings or the Vulcan renderer, this could be way faster. And next up, F-Zero GX. Maybe not. So knowing that the Ultra is based upon the N2+, Plus, maybe this micro SD will work for it. I'll just take it out of here, and pop it in the handheld, and then Bob's your uncle, right? No. But it is cool to see that people have already started working on a custom firmware. And in the Retro Handhelds Discord, early adopters have already started fiddling and sharing knowledge. Having a handheld that looks like this from the get-go is much more appealing. This preview build has 102 systems, as well as access to RetroWalk. But will PSP run any faster? Okay, pretty much the same. But how good does the Ultra run? Amiga. Okay, so it claims it's running at 50 FPS, but it is not smooth at all, it's very choppy. But as now we have access to the RetroArc menu, we can change some video settings. The setting we're going to change is threaded video, we'll just turn that off. Night and day. I have enough stamina to go all night. So, what do we think about the Ultra? It has a fast chip, it's quite cheap, and has a lot of potential once newer distributions are available. But with so many things going against it, we cannot recommend this unit. It's not a handheld for beginners, and it looks to be a prototype rather than something that should be for sale. As always, here's a big thank you to all of those on our Patreon. We appreciate all of the support you've given us, and we cannot thank you enough. Thank you. Here at Team Pandory, we make these video reviews, guides, as well as fix the A500 Mini and them cheap Chinese arcade boxes. I like telling dad jokes. Sometimes he laugh. Anyway, this is Binnie Me Chicken of Team Pandory, and I'll catch you on the next one. Ta-ra! Spec time.